Marketer of the Day, Episode 802, The Code of Business Building. Marketing, Product Development, and Launches with Tracy Childers. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting interview inside Double Agent Marketing. My name is Robert Plank, and we're going to talk today to a really smart guy. His name is Tracy Childers. If that name sounds familiar, you might have heard of his dad, John Childers, who teaches people how to speak and sell from the stage. He has a brother, J.J. Childers, who teaches people how to protect their assets, save money on taxes. But you're going to be blown away by the even better Childers, Mr. Tracy Childers. He is probably one of the smartest marketers you've ever come across in the past 10, 20, even 30 years or more. He's going to talk to you about how to work a lot smarter with your business and outsource it so that you can still make money but not do as much of the work. Hey, Tracy, what's up? Hey, Robert, thanks for that kind introduction. I, I don't know if I can live up to all that. Wow. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you're, you're a humble guy, outspoken guy, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you can live up to that and more if you put your mind to it. <laughs> um, so, you know, on top of what I just told everyone about you, I mean, I mean, if someone asked, what do you do, what would you tell them, I guess? That's kind of a funny question. I mean, all of uh, my friends here in town are like, you know, we've known you for I don't know how many years, but we still just don't know exactly what it is that you do. <laughs> and like, we know that you work from home and we know that you have a nice house and a nice car and everything, but we're kind of questioning, you know. So, you know, it really, um, you know, you said some kind words about uh, being uh, a, um, a good marketer. And, um, you know, if when you're talking to some people, you say, really, that's ultimately what it comes down to. It, it's I'd say that I'm an Internet marketer. Now, it, to break things down into what most people would uh, understand in terms of what do I actually do, I'd say that I'm a, uh, an owner of a small software development company. And so naturally, people immediately think, Oh, uh, so you're a programmer. Well, no, I'm not really a programmer. I, I don't even know how to write code. And, uh, that, that really throws people for a loop. So what, what I basically explain to, uh, people is say, so imagine, uh, a contractor on your house. You say, hey, I want to build this house. And the contractor says, okay, I know all of the steps that it takes in order to get that done. Then we're going to get a different uh, person to do the plumbing. We're going to get somebody else to do the framing. And then we're going to get somebody else to do the electrical wiring. So it's very much being like a contractor of a house. I guess I'm a contractor in terms of building uh, software uh, products and uh, and then people say oh so maybe you do that for a client no I don't ever uh, do that for clients for a piece you know work um, we do that because we try to find out what is it that people would want to buy so ultimately that leads back to hey I'm really an internet marketer at heart so it's it's almost like you're like a software contractor for yourself yeah, pretty much. I mean, we're we're building a company. I mean, I've always just kind of been interested in technical things and such. And uh, so I just kind of learned, hey, software is really the stuff that I'm most interested in. So why not try to make uh, cool software that other people like as well and then make money from selling it to them? And really the thing, uh, when I said I don't really do things for clients, um, I did do that in the past. What I realized is I really wanted to focus on one thing and make it as good as possible and then sell that same, that same thing over and over and over and over and over. So, you know, many of the products that I uh, have, you know, this, the exact same products has been sold thousands of times. Uh, so that's that's kind of a good position to be in. And, I mean, that's such a good point because, I mean, as a guy who does software myself, I was in the same position I would um, – make software or do jobs for other people before doing it for myself. And it's like, yeah. I mean, you're never going to care as much doing it for someone else as for yourself. Right. Right. Oh yeah. So, definitely. and and it's like you, you do a job for someone and then you get paid, you know, by hourly or for the job and then it's done, but it's cool. Like you said, to sell thousands of copies to, to improve it over the course of two or three years to like try out different features or even to be the contract, to, to be the guy in charge and say, well, yeah, I want to add this feature or like this feature, maybe the competitors have it or this sounds cool, but we don't want to like go in that direction. Yeah, and you know, you you said something like when when you uh, do the work for a client, and then you get paid for the um, 
the work, and then it's over. I think Robert Kiyosaki was uh, the one that I first really kind of understood that in his uh, book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, he calls it, you know, you're really just trading your uh, dollars for hours or your hours for dollars. And, you know, I, I just want to be able to focus on something and con- continuously and consistently make it better and better and better and then still be able uh, to sell it to multiple people. So that that's really kind of how I got into all that. And then, I mean, it sounds like, and we'll talk about some of your businesses in a few minutes, but um, the way that you set things up, once you kind of have it in motion, you don't really have to do too much. Yeah, exactly. And um, I guess that's kind of really the thing that I always kind of focus on. You know, a a lot of the products that I've done in the past, you know, I I have done them a little bit differently than the way I'm doing things now in the sense that, you know, it was really, it was kind of just me and uh, working with outsourcers. Uh, But then it's like I was kind of the brainchild on it. Like I set everything in motion, but my, my whole uh, I guess focus is always kind of um, how do I remove myself from the picture? And, and what I mean is um, like once the product is able to sell, I mean, how do I get out of doing all the technical support? Because I think when you and I first met, that was something that you were a ton of time on and what I realized is if you set it up the right way in the beginning and you're going to have to realize that the majority of the the questions for technical support will all come in in the beginning so you kind of have to answer them and then ultimately when you answer them then somebody else can come in and say oh now I see how it was done so I can just follow in your footsteps and do that and then I get somebody else to take over and now I'm on to you know whatever else I'm going to be doing so really all of that is the way that I work is I never ever ever get paid for the stuff that I'm actually working on right now it has to all be finished and then whenever it's finished that's when I start getting paid and see I'm, it's kind of cool because I get paid and I'm not even working on that. I'm completely done and I just keep generating money. And now I'm focusing on something new that will kind of move down in that cycle. And whenever it's finished, then I get paid on that. So you can imagine you start getting these multiple entities out that are past. Those are the ones that are generating money. So that's why uh, your income can really, really increase because it's not limited to the amount of uh, time that you have. Uh, that makes total sense, and and it's so cool, you're right, to, to get paid for stuff you did two, three, four, five years ago, and it's still paying yeah. you every day, every month. It's a great way to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's for sure. So, you know, before we get too too off on a tangent, um, tell me how you even how how you got or how did you even discover you know internet marketing and software and that kind of stuff. Well, it is a good question, Robert. You know, you had mentioned uh, that my father has uh, done quite a few seminars and also my brother is into it. Uh, So when my brother and I were at a a very, very young age, I mean, my father just kind of got us, you know, into working in his business. And I mean, basically... He, it wasn't internet marketing back then, it was information marketing. And the majority of the way, uh, that he did all of his was he sold things from, uh, seminars. And so, you know, he taught people how to invest in real estate. And I, really, like when I was 11 years old, it's crazy because I have a son that's that age. Uh, did you have hair then? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I had lots of hair then back then. Oh, um, heck yeah. But, uh, I mean, when I was 11 years old, I started, uh, duplicating audio tapes and putting them in the binders and, uh, packing them up in boxes and shipping them to things. So I just, that's the natural way I thought in terms of business is like, oh, wow, he created this thing one time and now we're sending it to, you know, thousands of people. So I always kind of thought that way. And then, um, I also always kind of got into computers as they were coming out and started learning, uh, new things about computers. And so naturally, um, right before the, the internet came along, 
Um, I was just really getting into computers and I was uh, doing uh, database work and exactly what I say I don't ever do, I used to do. I used to actually go to a client's office and I would kind of analyze, hey, what are you doing and how are you doing it with your computers and how are you tracking everything in terms of your database? And then I would design databases uh, for small businesses. So I kind of got into a little bit of programming, but I was using a, a program called FileMaker Pro, which was you know, it was kind of like Microsoft Access, and it had a really nice scripting uh, system in it. So I didn't really know how to write code, but I, I could build stuff. And so then kind of as evolution goes, I went and uh, I started creating uh, databases that were actual products. So I created some products, then my father was selling them at uh, seminars. And uh, so I really started doing that at a pretty young age, and then as the Internet came along, I uh, just like, man, this is just a natural fit. So I wanted to learn everything there was about how the Internet worked and how you could sell things. And, and that's kind of where uh, it just kind of went on from there. Awesome. And, I mean, and you have some of the coolest um, the coolest sites. I mean, the ones I know about, I know you have, like, a, a video player product, and then you have a, a caricature site. How did you even stumble across that. Yeah, well, those are both uh, completely different stories. Uh, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll just mention uh, the caricature site real quick. Um, I started uh, traveling to the Philippines and uh, started working with programmers over there. And then through the course, we, we met a guy that was just an extremely talented artist. And um, he really specialized in doing caricature. So, we, you know, uh, that's that's how that caricature site got uh, created. Um, uh, the other thing is actually, I think, a kind of a more important uh, lesson, and uh, the product is called FLV Producer. FLV stands for Flash Video, and the, the product's actually been out for quite a while now. You know, I, I think I've been selling it for about six years, uh, so you can imagine. Um, back then, everybody was fighting. They didn't really know what the ultimate... Um, video format was going to be the standard and you know flash video kind of emerged as the the winner at that time you know and uh, yeah. so people people wanted to have both playing in a flash video player on their website and really there were only a few ways of doing it and back then probably the the most popular one was a product called Sorensen Squeeze and what I what I found was that Every time I would talk to people, they would say almost exactly the same thing. And this is really, really key because once you understand this thing, this is how I've based the majority of my products and uh, businesses. They say, yeah, man, that's a great product, but it's just very complicated to use or complicated to understand or it just doesn't do this. I wish it would do that. And so I just kept hearing that over and over. And so then I decided, hey, you know what? I, something needs to be done better, you know? Uh, so that's where the FLV producer came along and it was a better uh, scenario than almost anything that that was out there at the time. You know, since then, uh, a lot of people have figured out, uh, you know, video is a hot thing. And then now there's, I mean, when I did that, that was even before YouTube, uh, no <laughs> Vimeo or anything like that, you know. Um, so cool. it's really, really changed quite a bit. So that's the same thing. You know, now uh, I have other software that's, uh, you know, gotten to be uh, quite popular and we have a big company behind it. But it was a very similar scenario in the sense that people were saying, I wish there was a solution that did this. And that's that's a cool way of going about it because, I mean, it always sucks if you're the first person. I mean, like, say you were the first person to come out with an FLV video player. It would kind of suck because you wouldn't have anything to base it on. You'd put in all this work into it and you wouldn't really know, you know, you know if you were designing it right or if it made sense. And then when someone inevitably knocked you off, then you'd feel like, well, I, you know, I was the guinea pig. I did all this work. But on the other hand, if you see that there already are video players out there and some do this, some do that. And you're like, well, I'm just kind of, I'm not going to copy what I'm just going to see. You know, they, they spent a year or two figuring out what went, what was right, what was wrong. And then I'll make my own, not knock off, but my own version of this. And then if someone else knocks me off, what's, well, it's okay because it's just, you know, I knocked someone else off to begin with. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that you said uh, some pretty key stuff there, Robert. Um, uh, number one is you, you say to to be the very first person. To me, uh, you know, there are people that are the very first, and to me, that seems to me like it's the most complicated scenario around. Um, where I think the majority of the money is is being almost first you know you can see what's kind of working so you don't have to completely create something from scratch you see what's kind of working and then you make it really good you know i mean i i spent tons of time on flv producer and tons of things that i didn't know and other people didn't know and we made it better but then what happens after that you said then there's knockoffs i mean i you know I guess you could take it as a compliment or something, but there were people that were coming out and they were seeing my success and they were copying almost to a T exactly. It's basically they were saying, hey, I want to make a clone of this software. I want it to do exactly what that one looks like. And I want it even to look the same. And people were making uh, players that looked almost identical. And, you know, you know, then they, they probably made a lot of money. But I, I just don't think that that's what you want to be in. I think you want to be just after first and kind of be a little bit innovative but not have to create everything on your own. One well, And what's funny is those people who tried to knock you off exactly, I bet that, I mean, it wasn't an exact copy. And there were probably like maybe a few little things that you said, well, you know, yeah. maybe they didn't even realize, but they made their own improvements. And it's, it's kind of like capitalism, right? Like, yeah. like they, they knock you off and then you can kind of like absorb the changes and, and, you know, get one step ahead of them again. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I mean I hate always whenever I talk about software to people I always end up going back to like like Apple and iPhone stuff but I mean everyone always kinds of you know talks about whatever like iPhone versus Android and it's like always like the Android phones they always come out with like the newest features first but they're always kind of you know they're they're the guinea pig and yeah. I mean it took I didn't take like a year or two for even an iPhone to come out with copy and paste because they just wanted to see how everyone else did copy and paste on a phone and then their way was the simplest because they said well there's five ways to do it there's, there's only one that makes sense yeah you know um i, I know we don't have a lot uh, of time robert and, and you you uh mentioned apple and iphone and stuff like that and i, I do want, want to say one thing because a lot of times people you know hear about software and stuff like that and they're like oh well that's all good for robert and tracy because those, those guys are technical and uh you know robert can write code and uh I really, really want to emphasize on the fact that I really do not know how to write any code. And so, you know, people, um, it's almost like they're using that as a scapegoat, you know? Um, yeah. You mentioned Apple, iPhone, and uh, Steve Jobs, you know? I mean, this is a guy that changed the world with his ideas, you know? And I can guarantee you that Steve Jobs didn't know anything about soldering a motherboard or you know these electronic connections he just knew and was very very good at saying this is what i want and let me tell somebody what i want so that they can do it and that right there is the exact same way that i go about creating software you don't know have to know how you how to do it you just have to get really good at explaining what you want and that's the whole key to the whole thing with the outsourcing and, and really working with somebody in order to create a great product. So, uh, so I mean, let's explore that. If someone was like you and they had an idea for a piece of software, I mean, how, how would they explain their idea? How would they um, get it developed and how would they remove themselves from the equation? Well, I mean, there's a lot of places that you can go to outsource. Um, one of my favorites, uh, you know, back in the day was rentacoder.com, and now I believe it's called V Worker for virtualworker.com. But basically, you can go there and you can post a project and you can just describe it. I mean, they, you know, you can, you know, you can type things out in text and say, I want it to look like this, and then here are some examples and stuff. But another great thing is a piece of software called Jing. Um, it's made by TechSmith and you know, you can capture your screen and you can draw arrows and, and you can point at things and, uh, you just talk. I mean, you can just tell people, you say, you know, I want this little thing. I want a piece of software that's, 
like example, I want a, a countdown timer, you know, and I wanted to have three blocks. One is the hours, one is the minutes, and one is the seconds. And then in order to set it, I want to be able to click on some buttons, and I want these buttons to have uh, up arrow and down arrow. When I click on the up arrow, it makes that number go higher. If I click on the down arrow, it goes uh, lower. You just kind of have to envision it all in your mind and be able to show what you have in your mind um, to somebody that's going to actually build it. And sometimes that might even be drawing it out on a piece of paper, you know, and draw on the piece of paper and say, hey, I realize that this doesn't look very good, but this is a, a general idea of what I want. Now, I found this other program. It does something totally different, but I really like the way that it looks. Make this program that you're building for me with this functionality that I just described look exactly like that. And if they don't do it right, then, hey, you, you kind of did it right, but here's what I wish you had done and, and change it. Just be really, really picky and get into as much detail as you possibly can. And it's funny that you mentioned, um, you know, when you're when you're saying, you know, I want the software to look this way, act this way. It's funny that you mentioned, you know, telling people, well, there's a similar piece of software here. I want it to look like this um, because I don't know about you, but I have some Google alerts on some of my software. So if someone mentions okay. like the name of my product or my website, I'll get an email. And every now and then on one of these sites, like you know, VWorker or like Odesk or something, um, someone will mention one of one of my products and they'll say, well, I see this guy's got a, a pop-up software. Can you make it yeah. look like this? But then, like you said, also add this, or also you know make it behave in, in this way as well. I mean, do you guys see that like with wishlist, for example? You see, yeah, you know, and I mean, sometimes I see it all the time, and, and especially back in the day with the uh, FLV producer, I'd see people post projects and like, I just want a clone of this software. I want it to be exactly like that, and yeah, with our uh, wishlist member software, I mean, we have uh, people doing stuff like that all the time and I mean we had a competitor uh, that that surfaced and it was like it, it was kind of a funny story because we had a competitor that really didn't have a very good product and then instead of uh, fixing his product he created yet another product which was a competition uh, to his other product which was basically a knockoff of ours. Oh, you know, so he he didn't get it right the first time, so instead I'm just going to clone theirs and and have a a new product, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But you know, and then ultimately stuff like that is really going to happen. So uh, then that's where you kind of come into the situation where um, it really takes more uh, to be a success than than just the coding of a product. I mean, there's a lot of other things, you know, how you deal with customers, how you market, how you position your stuff, and uh, you just really have to do it exactly how you want it, and that's uh, really the key. And, and um, I mean, it kind of ties back to in the beginning you were talking about, well, you know, I'm a marketer, and, and I mean, a lot of these guys, they're just coders, and they'll just, you know, copy what you have, but then yeah. they don't have the marketing, they don't have the traffic, they don't have the list, they don't have the customer support, so it's like they, they, they feel like they've cloned you, but they've only got like 10% of it, right? Yeah, you know, and I mean, you're right, you said a lot of these guys are just coders and stuff, and I mean, some of them don't even have uh, really good English skills, and, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, what does it take to have, uh, you know, a successful website or a successful product that's being sold on a website, and like, you know what, it really is not that complicated. You know, there, it's not like there's just a, a magic formula. You know, you hear about the, oh, the copywriting formula. You have to have, you know, a specific headline and testimonials and stuff. Here, here's really the magic formula. Um, and, and it all boils down to one very, very simple thing. When somebody finds out about your product and they come to the, the website, do they get this feeling of, wow, this is exactly what I was looking for, exactly what I was looking for. And and the majority of the time when you go somewhere, you don't say yes to that answer, you know, or that question. You look at it and you're like, man, I, 
I think this is what I'm looking for, but I'm not sure if it does this. You know, I'm not sure. Some, I just, they haven't really described this thing properly. Maybe it does this or maybe it does. I'm just not sure. You ultimately need to, uh, your visitors need to come there and look at what you have and say, this is exactly what I wanted. And if you can get some pe- people saying that, you're going to have a home run and an extremely successful product. So how do you do that? Well, I mean, uh, you do it a multiple uh, of ways. And number one is you have to put yourself in the position of a customer. And sometimes that's not always easy because, you know, you're thinking, um, uh, you know, you're thinking, oh, this is exactly what everybody wants. And then you're not really the end user. Uh, so you really need to be an end user of your product, meaning I'm building something that I would use for myself as well. Uh, you know, we, we build wishlist member for membership sites. We also run membership sites. So, um, we, we have a pretty good pulse. Now, once you, once you get to the point, uh, where you're selling it and now you're going to be getting uh, feedback from your current customers, man, you know, I wish you could do that. And you, you, you touched on this, Robert, uh, earlier. You can't do everything that every customer asks for, but when people are asking for things and, and many people are asking for the same thing, it's a pretty good indication of that's a popular thing and you really should implement it. Um, another thing is when you're early getting started out, uh, get some of your friends or your family members to, to take a look at it, at your website, and, and say, tell me what you think about this. And and sometimes they'll just say, wow, I totally get it. I understand what you do now. Um, but sometimes they're like, I don't understand this. And the reason why is you, you just automatically assumed. Like, for example, um, wishlist member, uh, you know, we might have initially just automatically assumed people were running WordPress on their website. You know, but somebody knew, they're like, oh, I get it. You're doing a, a membership software. They don't even know what WordPress is, so you got to be very, very specific and explain that. Uh, so that's just kind of an example. And there are also uh, some of these other sites that have popped up recently um, where you can uh, go and um, request feedback. I think one of them is like feedbackarmy.com or something like that. Uh, but you, you you can pay like a uh, hundred bucks and uh, you get people, fresh people that are reviewers that don't know anything about your site and they will go to your website and they'll just record their first reaction. That's an awesome way to find out what people are thinking when they hit your website. Especially if, if they're not the crowd you're used to. If there's like a, like a mass yeah. market coming in off the street type of person. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's cool, and I mean, I, I know we're way out of time, but in the last couple of minutes, um, I want to talk to you about Wishlist Member because it's like it's too good to to pass up. Um, sure. I mean, I mean, you guys definitely, you know, you guys weren't the first membership software. You definitely weren't even like the first like twenty, thirty, or probably even like a hundred. But um, as far as I saw, I mean, before Wishlist Member came out, if you wanted to have a membership site, you'd have to kind of you know, install this software, tweak these files, add all these other plugins. I mean, setting up one membership site used to take a whole day pretty much. And yeah. you guys were the first, like, big or, I guess, like, you know, popular uh, membership software that ran as a WordPress plugin. And, you know, ever since then, there's been a lot of, I guess, copycats. But that's just kind of going back to, like, we're talking about people already had membership software, but then... um you know, when when you try to set up member sites or Stu did, it was just such an ordeal. And so you guys uh, really like filled the hole in the marketplace. So I mean, how did you um, how did you get involved in that one? Well, that is uh, really um, a great story. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you ever knew this or not, but uh, Stu and I have been uh, great friends for a very long time. Um, probably like. Nine years, maybe. And um, whenever I used to teach at uh, seminars, I would speak at seminars, um, and I used to sell products from the stage. And uh, I had done a fair amount of speaking at seminars and selling products, but the very first time I was speaking at a seminar and selling my own product which was, uh, here's how you can create your own information products. I taught people how to record themselves in audio and stuff. You know, you're always a little nervous and you're not sure 
uh, if anybody's going to buy it. Um, so I made uh, my presentation and I made my offer. And the first person in the room to stand up and buy my uh, uh, product was Stu McLaren. And so Stu was my very first customer. And uh, we developed a, a great friendship. And then over the years, Stu had just become a phenomenal marketer. And uh, Stu had never really uh, done any software products or, or any real products where he was selling products over and over and over, like we talked about earlier in, in this interview. And uh, so I told him kind of where I was at, and I was kind of shifting gears, and I had assembled uh, a software development team, and I said, you know, we can build anything. And uh, I was kind of in the midst of looking for a new project, and he said, man, I have some great ideas. And so the idea initially was uh, a membership solution. And, uh, you know, I, and it's exactly like you said, Stu was very frustrated in trying to set it up. I mean, it was very similar to what I said earlier on about the Swords and Squeeze. People were like, everybody's using this product, but everybody's saying the same thing. It's complicated. And, you know, I won't uh, mention any names of uh, software programs because I don't want to... You, you won't mention them. a member ship I software? I, I won't throw them under the bus or anything, right. but, I, but I will tell you that Stu was trying to set up a member site. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so anyways yeah he was using a member and um he just couldn't get it and uh you know Stu's actually a pretty technical guy you know he can set up a website and stuff and um like if 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 I can't do this there's got to be tons of other people that can't do it and uh so you're right uh there were maybe a hand, a couple of other programs that were actually WordPress plugins, um, and they, they actually had kind of a major flaw in them as well. And uh, the, the big flaw that we saw is, number one, they weren't doing what the customers wanted because these guys were coders and they weren't running membership sites. And um, But the other flaw is what they were doing is they were building kind of a, a membership solution and then turning it into a WordPress plugin. Okay, so the difference is it looked like what they originally built, but then they just made it work for WordPress. It so, was just an afterthought. Yeah, so what we did instead was like this thing is going to be a WordPress plugin from the beginning, and so the way we built it, it was like, man, this is all the functionality that WordPress should have had to run membership sites. It looked like WordPress, it felt like WordPress, it was WordPress, and so people were uh, completely, you know, drawn to like, man, this just all makes sense. So that's really kind of how we, we got into that and kind of differentiated ourselves. And really just uh, as we were going, I mean, Stu was, uh, did a great job with all the marketing and uh, building up the community. And then we also really, really focused on listening to the customers and what they wanted. And uh, we just continued to do that. And, and really that, that's one way that, I mean, um, that, Lance and I really like wish this, and when we tell people about it, we're like, well, I mean, I'm sure there's all, lots of other, uh, lots of other membership solutions that will give you digital access to a uh, membership site. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they'll try to, you know, they'll, ma they'll do things like they'll match feature by feature and they'll say, well, we do, we do, you know, 50 extra things. And we'll say, well, that's fine, except for you're probably not going to use all those 50 things. And yeah. it's so complicated to use. I mean, wouldn't you, I, I don't know, it's like, which is better? A, a simple membership plugin that does what you want and you can use it or one that does all kinds of crazy stuff, but you can't even figure out how to, how to turn it on. Yeah. And you know, Robert, um, some, some of those, uh, uh, other um, competitors and stuff, you know, yeah, you know, I can't, I can't knock them down. You know, I mean, some of them have some pretty good solutions, but one of the things that we hear uh, a lot of times, like, man, the owner of the company actually got on the phone with me and installed this thing for me, and I'm thinking, what, what's wrong with that picture? You know, I, I realize that that's a good thing where somebody gave you really good customer, but. If the owner of the company has to get on and install the thing for you, is it really that easy to do? Right, um, good point. So, 
you know, I'm like, okay, that, that might be the one that you want, but uh, that's not what we want. Um, we want it to be a scenario where we have thousands of customers that can do it on their own, and we have a support team that backs them up whenever they get into trouble. And, uh, I mean, that would just be – I just couldn't live my life uh, dealing with uh, calls all day long, doing customer support, and also trying to run a company. Just well, that would be back to company. trading dollars for hours, yeah. right? Exactly, yeah. So I mean, just to just to my, I understand your role in this. So pretty much, Sue said I have the, this idea for a uh, word, a membership plugin that's actually built in WordPress. He designed it, and then and you um, so then you, did you like like improve the designs, or your job was like you made it in terms like a programmer could understand? Or I mean, what, what role did you play in that? Well, I really kind of had the role of just sort of piecing the whole team together, you know, and okay. uh, like here's what we want to accomplish, and here's, uh, you know, uh, some of the some of the, sometimes we, like with the technical details, like with databases and stuff, that, you know, that kind of falls, and like I just have to explain what what it is that a customer is going to use, and there's just a lot of little decisions along the way, but um, really, Stu and I acted uh, very much as a team, continuously working with the uh, the programmers and such. And I mean, we're just very fortunate that I, I found, you know, an excellent programmer that can really take things. Um, you know, and, and that's one of the things that I, I've learned along the way is, uh, you know, a lot of times people will say, yeah, well, that's good for you. Um, but the programmer that I'm working with, he just, he just can't get things done like that. And it's like, well, you got a major problem. You need to get rid of the person and find somebody else. Uh, you know, just because you like a person doesn't mean that they're always going to get the job done. So um, you really do need to have some good talent that can do the things that you're asking for. Makes sense to me. And and that's such, I mean, I think that's such a good way just to, you know, wrap this all up, tie this all together is that, I mean, you, you don't have to do everything yourself. And there's some things that, you know, you'll, you'll just never be good at. So, you know, yeah. why even try? Just, you know, focus on what's fun for you, what you're good at. And then if it comes down to, you know, maybe if, if you can put some of your own skills into it, like, you know, designing the database or figuring out, like, what's the, the best way to, like, structure this. But then when it comes down to things like, you know, coding and things like that, you don't need to know everything. You just have the right person to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Having the right people is always key. And, it, and uh, it goes back to the example that I said uh, as being a contractor on a house. Uh, you're going to tell me exactly what you uh, want, and I need to take your vision saying, hey, Robert's really wanting to build this nice house, and he's going to want it done right. And if I go in there and I have somebody that's that's not a really good plumber, uh, it's just going to make me look bad, you know? Uh, it's like i got to have the right people to do these things because my job is to make sure that the end result is what's going to work. And that really sums it all up. You need to make sure that what gets done it was your vision, and that's what the customers wanted. That that's really it boils down to that. And and it's it's so funny, especially with software, is that I mean you really do have to be kind of a uh, like a like a neat freak. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I, I mean. I, as someone who doesn't know software, they'll say, oh, well, I mean, they'll have a picture in the head of, I want it to look this way, and they'll explain it, and they'll assume people know. But, I mean, if you don't say, I mean, like you said, with, like, the count on timer, if you don't say separate hours, minutes, seconds, yeah, have yeah. these up and down arrows, and then see what they come back with and say, well, change, you know, you might have to go through several iterations, but it's mm-hmm. like you almost have to be, like, overly tedious and just be like, well, even though, you know, I have to say, like, well, It'll, it's got to be a gray button and have like yeah. the triangular arrow just because, I mean, that's the way that you want it to look, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. So, I mean, we talked about a lot of cool, uh, interesting stuff today. I'm, I'm really glad I finally have the story of, you know, how you got into uh, information marketing, how you, um, you know, went from designing databases for others into making your own products into kind of just saying, well, now I'm going to, you know, establish the business. I'm going to establish uh, this, you know, I know this guy who's an artist. I'm going to get all the, the system in place, get the order system, the, the sales letter, all that shopping cart, all that stuff, and make a caricature site. Um, you know, things like FLV Producer where you had the software made 
and then you used it and you figured out, you know, how you would want it to behave, what improvements you wanted to make, then got customer feedback or even saw how people would use it without even knowing about the software and kind of making it more intuitive. And I mean, I don't know, I guess there's a, there's, there's always things where someone makes a statement and it kind of sticks with me like my entire life. And something, one thing that, that you said to me a couple of years ago was, um, and like we talked about this before when we were talking about the support desk, you told me that for this LFOA producer, uh, piece of software that you had not even logged in to the support desk in like two years, I think. So, <laughs> and, and even that was like two years ago. So, I mean, now it's been like four years. So, I mean, as soon as you told me that, it just blew my mind. It changed the way I looked at the entire thing. I, you know, I realized that I don't have to do everything myself. And it's kind of, it, it kind of is cool to, um, get to the point where no one really knows what you, maybe even you don't know what you, you're just a guy who, you're like the, the, the owner, the contractor, you do the fun, like high level setting up stuff. Maybe at first you do a little bit of the work and figure out, you know, how am I going to answer these top five, top 10 questions? Maybe you're going to figure out, well, I'm going to tweak this in the sales letter or change this in the software. But then what's so cool about digital products, information marketing software, all that good stuff is that once it's set up, then it's done. And yeah. so, I mean, then you can have it sell over and over. And um, so then, and so I really want to thank you for helping everyone who wants to know how to make software because they should just go to VWorker and then maybe describe, maybe look at some of the other jobs, use a tool like Jing to uh, kind of record a video and show, you know, I want it to look like this, maybe base it on this other competitor or maybe even draw what the design looked like and I like the way you broke down because you said well there's like there's the design part of it like we use the, the council timer maybe there's the design and then there's like the functionality like maybe there's these buttons but then also there's there are like I'm, you're pretty much like making like a tutorial like well there's the, the look and there's the buttons but if I wanted to actually use it maybe I would you know set this time then hit the start button and then it would start counting and I think a lot of programmers or, or coders who don't actually use the thing they're making, they really miss that. They just say, well, you know, it's going to be a membership plugin. It'll have all these screens. I'm done. But the way that I kind of see the way that Wishes was designed is you kind of design it as, well, what's the easiest way for someone to install it? What's the easiest way right. for someone to now allow someone to purchase access using the software? You know what I mean? Like, there's not just the, the look and the design, but there's also, like, the steps – um, someone uh, goes to. And I hope everyone listening got that website. It's called Feedback Army. And I'm, I've never heard of that. I'm going to try it out myself where you can have people try out your website and give you feedback on what were uh, their first impressions. And I mean, you just solidified how important it is to, you know, have your own team, have your own products, because if it wasn't for all those assets, all that stuff you had in motion to be in with the system, then you would not have partnered with Stu on Wishlist. And, you know, maybe... I would I would say that wishes probably would not have been made or wouldn't have been nearly as popular as it was. But you guys you know, worked together. You guys had the vision. You had a design, and then put it out there. Um, got the feedback. Saw what other people were doing with membership software. Saw what the customers needed. Saw what you guys needed, and um, you know just had a way easier time. Worked way less than if you were still doing work for clients. If you were still going around. Um, setting up databases. Instead, you're like the software contractor for yourself, set it up, and um, and it's all, all done. So uh, my final question to you is, if someone wanted to see what you're working on, what you're doing, uh, where should they go, Tracy? Oh, wow, that's a, a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, have their own site, and I think I have a personal site that I haven't updated in like three or four years or so. Um, really, the best place to go to find out what I'm currently working on is wishlistproducts.com, and that's the site for our company, and uh, that will kind of lead you off to the different things about Wishlist Member and uh, our wishlist insider community and different things of that nature. But, uh, I really spend the majority of my time now on wishlist products. Wishlistproducts.com. So that's W I S H L I S T P R O D U C T S dot com. So, I mean, when are you going to, um, start using Twitter, man? I thought you were finally getting on that. 
<laughs> yeah, I uh, I've done a little bit of it, and just I don't know, I'm just too lazy, I guess. Ah, uh, too too busy doing the fun stuff, doing the contracting. <laughs> well, right. you know, what, you, I I don't know. Maybe you should just go to ViewWorker and outsource your tweeting, outsource your blogging. That way, you can just be like, well, now everything's outsourced, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe someday, but until then, I guess everyone should go to wishlessproducts.com. Go ahead, go there right now. Find out what new exciting things Chase is working on with software, with Wishless member, with their community Wishless Insider, and with any other plugins that they are adding. On top of that, wishlessproducts.com. And thanks a bunch, Tracy Childers, for talking to us in this extra long session about uh, outsourcing products and software. Thanks a lot for having me, Robert. I appreciate it. DFYpodcast.com forward slash free. Go there right now to see what you could be missing in your podcast. Maybe you aren't active enough on social media. Are you writing and broadcasting an email for every episode of your podcast? Do you follow up with your podcast guests? Do you do things to make your podcast interview and content creation easier? Go to dfypodcast.com slash free to claim your gift right now.